So, how you doing? Good. All right. That was much better. That was much better. Yeah. If, if we were in, in class right now, you get a gold star. So, yeah. <laughs> Very good. But um, what we're going to be talking about today, um, this morning, is a little bit building on what we did last night. And that is, why do I exist? As some of you know, um, I used to be a teacher. Um, I taught for 25 years, both in public school and also in uh, private Christian school. So I've spent a lot of time in classrooms. And one thing that I did, particularly towards the end of my teaching career, is I used to take Fridays and I would only teach half a period. Now, that sounds a little strange maybe, but what I did, and on the first day of class, first day of the school year, um, when I'm passing out the syllabus for my classes, and I mainly taught high school at this, time, at the, at this point, and I said, what we're going to do is every Friday, um, I'm only going to go half a period, and then we're going to stop what we're doing, and we're just going to talk. And whatever's on your mind, we're going to talk about it. If you have work you want to work on or something like that, you can go ahead and do, but um, I just want to talk with you and just... We'll just get to know each other better like that. So I did that for like 10 years, my last 10 years of teaching. But I remember one time, first day of school, you know how the first day of school, sometimes in the public school system, you only have like half a, um, half a day or something. So it's the half day thing. And, so, um, and it was, a, it was a, a Friday. We had our first day on a Friday. And so I'm passing out the syllabus and I'm telling my students, okay, uh, this is what we're doing, this is what we're doing, this is what we're doing throughout the course this year. But then I said, now, when we get to Fridays, we're only working half a day because I'm going to sit and talk with you, and we're just going to talk back and forth, and um, you can ask questions, whatever's on your mind, and we'll just talk about it. And I remember this one kid, his name was Jamie, and Jamie says, so we can ask you questions? And I said, yeah, that's the point of this. And he goes, so we can ask you any type of question, and you'll give us the answer? And I said, well, I'm not going to do your homework for you. you know, if you're doing you know, you're a calculus question, you're going to be in trouble if you ask me. I'm a biologist. So um, I said, no, I that, that, you know, can't help you with that. But he says, the general questions we can ask him? Like, yeah. And, and you'll give us the answer. I said, if I know the answer, you know, if I don't, I'll tell you I don't know the answer. And he says, um, well, today's a Friday. I go, yeah. And he says, can we start now? Okay, <laughs> you got a question you want to ask? And as a joke, now Jamie was sort of a prankster, but what he did, he says, I have a question for you. Give me the answer to this. What's the meaning of life? <laughs> What's the meaning of life? And the class laughed. And I said, oh, <laughs> whoo, she. And he goes, uh-huh, yeah, I got you, right? I said, no, I thought you were going to ask me something hard. <laughs> I said, I can give you that one. And he goes, you, you have an answer for that. I said, oh, yeah. And I had a Bible sitting in my, on my lab table there, and I picked up my Bible, and I said, the answer's right in here. Um, we are created to be um, in fellowship with God. We're created in his image, and we are created to have a close relationship with God. We're supposed to worship him, and that's where we find fulfillment in life, and we do good things uh, for people um, once we enter into this relationship with him. And He's like, you know, the whole class sitting there stunned. And I said, well, that, that's the answer. So today we're going to talk about this. Why do I exist? What's the whole point of me existing? And this is an important question. I get asked this frequently. I get asked this not just of uh, high school students. College students have asked me this many times. Adults have asked me this. Children have asked me this. I've been asked this many times. And one thing that we should always do, parents, and speaking to you here, we always should give good answers to our kids. And when they ask questions dealing with life, we need to give them good, solid biblical answers. Because I do believe that this is the blueprint on how to live, how to have a successful life. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says he came to give us an abundant life. Well, here's where we get the answers for this. This is the blueprint. He wrote a 66 love letters here, and he explains everything we need to know on how to live 
in that blueprint, this manual on how to live our life here, it's all in there. And we need to give good answers for this. We need to study it, parents. We need to understand this kind of stuff and to study it ourselves so when our children do ask us questions like, um, Mommy, where do I come from? Now, that could have two different meanings now that I just said that one. Um, yeah, we're talking about um, what's our purpose? <laughs> and Like, where do we come from that way? I'm not talking, yeah, it looks nice we're having weather, isn't it? <laughs> So, got myself in a corner on that. But anyway, <laughs> let's, let's go back. And as we we're talking about and focusing on Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, I want to back up and go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. I mentioned this last night, and I know probably most of you in this room have this memorized, and it's not a problem. But as we look at this, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not the result of works so that no one may boast. Now, there's a lot here. And I mean, this is a great verse to memorize, this passage here. Great verses to memorize. By grace you've been saved. Um, it's not your own thing. It's a gift from God, a free gift from God. Many years ago, now I, I do these every year. I go down to the Florida Keys. I take high school students and I go down to the Florida Keys um, with about 30 students and I teach marine biology. Um, we swim with sharks. We swim with... Um, sometimes with manatees, we pet stingrays, uh, we hold octopuses and stuff like this. It's a lot of fun. We see dolphins and, and things. And so I've been doing this since the 1980s. So over like 36, 38 years I've been doing these trips. And as we um, went down there one time, and we always do a Bible session every night. And on this one trip, the hotel we were using at the time had a little store in there. And at the store, we had our official drink is called is from Arizona Tea. It's called Mucho Mango. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but that is the official drink of the marine biology trip. And one gal went on the trip <laughs> a few years ago, back in 2019, and it is the official drink of our trip. Yeah, everybody drinks Mucho Mango. That's the thing. And Arizona Tea has been very good to us because I called up Arizona Tea back uh, a couple of years ago, and I told him that you're our, our official drink for the trip. Oh, well, let me donate a couple hundred cans to you. And they did. And so this year's trip, I called him up again. And I said, you know, I'm doing the trip again. Uh, you want to make it done? He says, oh, sure. Uh, he says, I remember doing that. And he says, How many, did, did you have enough? I said, no, we ran out halfway through. And it was like 270 cans? Yeah, it wasn't enough. He says, okay, I'll, I'll fix that. I'll send a couple more cases. So he did. This year we had Mucho Mango, literally we could swim in it. We had so many cans. <laughs> Just cases and hundreds and hundreds of cans. And even halfway through the week, without us knowing anything about it, he shows up again with another shipment of more cans. Wow. And while we couldn't leave it at the hotel, we still have cases of it, or one case I think at home right now. Charlotte here, who works at my house, because that's where our recording studio is, she drinks this stuff like fish drink water, I'm telling you. <laughs> She's never been on the trip, but, <laughs> but no. Oh, that's true, you did, that's right. You came as the photographer. I was, I was on half a trip. You were half a trip, you didn't get to stay the whole time. That's right, she did come. So, okay, now you, you justified in my heart. <laughs> but one time on this trip, what I did is I had made beforehand, actually I had you do it, Charlotte, uh, when you were still working at Fort, we made little like business size cards that said, this is good in the store for a free can of Mucho Mango. And this is before we had the shipments free. We had to, the students had to buy it at the store. So everybody, during the session, the Bible session, I was explaining about salvation. And that night, I handed out to every single one of the students, every person on the trip, one of these cards. And they're all like, what is this? And I said, notice what it says. This entitles the bearer, it's non-transferable, can't give it to somebody else. This gives the bearer free access to a can of Mucho Mango from the store. And I arranged it with the store that they would collect these, and at the end I would pay them for how many that would be there. The whole point was, that's how salvation is. Did the kids have to do anything to earn that card? Nada. It was a free gift. And I said, you don't earn your way into heaven. This verse, you don't earn your way into heaven. You get a free gift. Well, somebody had to pay for it, right. I'd pay for it. You don't pay for it. It's grace. 
I'm just giving you this because I care about you and it's hot down here and I want you to have something. And that's sort of like salvation. God loves us. He pays the price. That's what this verse is talking about. Not by something that we do. It's what God has done. But then we get to the second verse. Now, we memorize this one, but we often don't study the second verse, which is, for we are his workmanship. And this is a different translation. This is English standard. Um, ponia is the word. Pomima. But the thing is, workmanship is the same word that's often used in Greek for masterpiece. So... Last night we were out of the NLT, workmanship masterpiece. We are the masterpiece. And like becoming a masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works. See, it says it right there. Here's a purpose for us. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And as I said last night, we're focusing on this verse. Last night we focused on workmanship, being a masterpiece. You are a masterpiece. But now we're going to focus on this morning... Why do I exist? There's some really good questions that people often ask. Why was I saved? Why do I exist? What is my purpose in life? Those are questions a lot of people ask, particularly college students on that last one. Um, what is my purpose in life? What am I going to school for? What am I going to do as a career? Well, we're going to give you some insight from God's perspective of what your purpose in life is. Why you exist and why you were even saved. Well, last night we talked a little bit about that first one, why we were saved, because God loves us, and he made us in his image. We've messed up and sort of fallen away from God, but the thing is, God loves us so much, he wants us to be in fellowship, in a relationship with him. But we're not holy, he is, so he has to chip off pieces that don't fit, because he's trying to make us to be like his son. So like jealousy, like hatred, like lust, uh, stealing, lying. He has to chip these things off. Sometimes it feels good when you get rid of some of these things. Other times, God, this is going to hurt. And it does, as we talked about last night. Because that's how he has to do it. We are a work of art. We are created beings made in the image of God. I'm going to talk about that today in just a minute. Made in the image of God. And so we are supposed to reflect and be like God. We're supposed to be like Jesus. And that's why God is, is shaping us into this masterpiece to be more and more like Jesus. And that's why we go through this. Various circumstances uh, come along in life where we have pieces getting chipped off. Or we have difficulties and things that, that God allows us to go through. And we go through these things and it helps to make the masterpiece of what we are. So we do see these kind of things happening. Now... As I said, that word workmanship, don't get messed up with this, it's the word poema in Greek, which is the same word as workmanship, masterpiece. It's an interchangeable word here. Different translations will call it workmanship. Others will call it masterpiece. Same thing. It's a work of art. You are not junk. You are a work of art. You're not an accident. Though the science of Darwinian evolution in public schools and in institutions and unfortunately even in some churches now teach that we evolved from an ape-like creature that we're not made in the image of god that god actually um, started everything billions of years ago and let it just run well that is not what scripture says it says god created us he didn't say i transformed this animal into make it into my image. no it doesn't say that he created us in his image this is something very very profound and it's very important that we all understand this because you turn on the tv and you watch what are some of these tv shows like dinosaur train and other things they talk about the earth being billions of years old and they talk about how um, animals change from one type of animal into another there is no evidence of this whatsoever None. And as a biologist, I can tell you this. Now, I used to, to be totally honest, I'll be straight up with you here, I used to be a Darwinian evolutionist. I used to teach this. Matter of fact, I used to debate people about this. My targets were pastors. I would go after pastors and sort of, in a way, embarrass them. I never lost a debate. As a Darwinian evolutionist, I never lost a debate. You know why? It's because pastors generally did not know the right questions to ask. 
People just don't understand. I could throw science papers at a pastor. All he could do was quote Bible verses to me, and he couldn't back them up with anything else. So it was, they were easy, easy prey. I hate to say it. Um, so we need to have good answers and stuff, because I no longer believe that. As I worked in the field of evolution, Darwinian evolution, in grad school, um, I walked away from this. I jumped ship on it because I started seeing there's a lot of problems with this. Even a very famous um, biologist, Stephen Jay Gould, one of the greatest biologists probably of the last century, even said there's no fossil evidence to back this up, to back up that we came from ape-like creatures, that this whole thing of, it started, um, that w somehow miraculously a life form started and it started to change and just kept changing until we get all the different life forms today. And I'm like, really, are you kidding? Even, but he even said, there's no evidence really to back it up. But even so, I'm gonna believe in it because I don't like to think about the alternative. That was Stephen Jay Gould. You are not an accident. You're not something that just happened by random chance. God made you for a purpose. You are here for a purpose. You are here for a reason. Not just because your parents said you're going. There is a purpose. God oversees everything. He knows you by name. He knows all about you. He loves you. And there's nothing more you can do to make God love you more. He loves you that much. So much that he would sacrifice his own son for you. But you are not junk. And don't let anybody ever tell you that. I've counseled many people, mostly high school students in the past, that had the impression they were just junk, just leftover garbage of evolution or something. Oh, no, that is not true. Now, a lot of times we get into this thing, and if you watch TV shows like on the Discovery Channel or PBS or something or Nova, you come across things where they'll show you this image over here. And this is called Lucy, for those of you who are not familiar. This is Lucy, and they say that this is our early ancestor. If you, if you look on television, you watch PBS, they're going to show you pictures. This picture here, this statue here is in the, I believe this one here is from the zoo in, um, or museum in St. Louis. And it shows um, they found a fossil back in the 1970s, I think it was 1974. A, Ken by, uh, a guy by the name of Ken Johansson found partial parts of a skeleton. And he was searching and trying to prove, for one, that the Bible's not correct. He's trying to prove that there was an ape-like creature that we descended from. That is our great, 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 grandfather. That that's what he looked like. Or actually, in this case, she looked like, because that's a female. I want you to notice something. Notice how the legs are. Now, this thing only stands about this high. It's, it's short. So, but look how the legs, doesn't the le don't the legs look like a human, look like human legs? I mean, yeah, maybe hairy. Man, those are more hairy than my dad's, you know. Um, but they sort of look human, the way that they're standing and stuff. Notice that in one hand, um, she's holding, it looks like a burrito with extra lettuce or something, I don't know. She's holding something looking like food how a human would do that. Go to a state fair, don't you see people standing in that pose with a, um, with a burrito in their hand? Uh, in the other hand, it's across her chest, but notice the way that the hand is displayed. Looks like a human hand, does it not? Except maybe a little hairy. Looks just like a human hand. The wrist action, uh, or the wrist shape, the fingers and everything, all look human. Even the face, as it's standing there, Looks like it's gazing and thinking. Now, there is a lot of make-believe in this, or shall I say the word bias in this. As they assembled this thing, they're trying to prove to you <laughs> that the little parts of skeleton that they found, when you assembled it, this is what you got. That is not right. I'm going to show you in just a second what the skeleton actually looks like. Um, actually, the same skeleton is used to make the picture here on the right. This is a picture from uh, the Creation Museum. Exact same skeleton. Notice, though, how this one's portrayed. 
And the reason it's portrayed like this, it's not standing upright like a human, it's standing more like a tree climbing ape. Notice that the wrists are not across the chest like a human. Notice the wrists are like a chimp or a gorilla, a locking type of wrist, that they would walk on that. Uh, the legs don't, you can't see the legs too well here, but they don't look human. Notice there's hair all over the body. Notice the face, how different. By the way, if you go up to these kind of images at the Smithsonian Institute, or if you go up to this one in the St. Louis Zoo, and you look very close, really, really close at the eyes, you'll see that there's white around the eyes in that one. How do we know that? How do they know that it had white eyes? Is that fossilized? No. Why did they do that? And every one, they will always show you white eyes. What color is your eye around the, re uh, or around the uh, iris? White, white sclera, that's what we have. So they put white sclera on all of these to make it look more human. You don't even notice this. Every textbook, as I teach in a biology textbook, every single close-up image of Lucy's face shows human features to it and shows a white sclera around the eye. That is not human. This one, it's yellow. Can't see it too close because it's not an up-close picture. Because apes and chimpanzees and stuff, they have yellow sclera, not white like a person. But they do this, so they trick they have a bias. They're trying to make you think this is totally human, an early human. It's not. I believe this is what Lucy looks like. I think she was an extinct tree climbing ape. Now, how did they get to this image? Notice again how the stance is, how the pelvis is to the legs and how the knees are. Notice it looks just like maybe Uncle Fred, right? I keep saying uncle, it's maybe Aunt, <laughs> Aunt Louise or something. <laughs> But that's, that's how it sort of looks now, that it's standing like that. Now, I'm going to show you the skeleton, the actual skeleton of how they did this. All right, you ready to see it? This is Lucy's skeleton. That's it. That's the complete skeleton. Yeah, wow. Exactly. Notice that one leg is totally missing below the knee. So we don't have the opposing uh, femur bone here, thigh bone, we don't have that one. This one's missing, this tibia bone is missing. Yet, they will often put like, you know, images and they'll try and assemble this. Um, notice on the, the skull itself, the skull's just in a few pieces. There's hardly anything with the hands. Remember the hands, how human they looked? Where's the hands? There's a few little phalange bones here. Um, a little bit of a wrist bone here. Even with the wrist bone there, <coughs> Dr. Um, Menton from Mayo Clinic, in studying this, he said, in studying human anatomy, because he's a doctor and this is what he specializes in, he says, that's not human. This, the little features you see here, are the same type what you would see in a tree climbing ape. And, I, I, could you get my bag? There's a DVD in there, I wanna just show people. Um, I wanna tell you about the pelvis. There. I want to tell you about the pelvis of this thing because the pelvis of this is so interesting. Ken Johansson, who was the guy who found this skeleton in Ethiopia, he was trying to find something that would prove to the world that we are not created by God, that the Bible is wrong, that we actually came from an extinct type of, of like ape-like creature and that we evolved and over time we just changed into what we are today, but this is our ancestor. So he tried to do things. Now when he found something, this bone right here, part of the pelvis is fascinating. And you, you can't see it when you go to the zoos or anything like this or museums because it's, it's not usually on display. But if you look at that, and if you study what a human pelvis looks like, if you see like a human skeleton, you'll find something very interesting. That this pelvis, looks almost exactly like a human pelvis. And this was the big key to this whole thing. The science program NOVA, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's usually on PBS, NOVA. Back in the early 2000s, NOVA did a special on Lucy. They have removed it from their library today, you cannot access it, it's gone. Unless you bought it years ago, you can't get a copy of it. 
but they talk about how Ken Johansson actually got this skeleton and how he formed it. This pelvis bone, when he found it, it didn't look like that. It looked totally different. What did it look like? It looked like a chimp's pelvis. Wait a minute. If this one shows it's human, how, how can it be a chimp's? I'm not making this up. Ken Johansson, and this was even on Nova, Ken Johansson took the pelvis and he said, oh, this pelvis has fossilized incorrectly. I know what happened. Lucy died on the edge of a stream, and when her skeletal remains were all that remained, a deer or some deer-like creature walked along the bank, stepped on the pelvis, and broke the pelvis. Yet, the bones stayed close to each other, and they fossilized in the shape of a chimp's pelvis. <gasps> I can fix that. So he took the bone, went back, and took a Dremel power tool, and sat and carved it. I have this, if you don't believe this, part of that Nova is on this DVD, and you can watch this. You can get this from Answers in Genesis, Creation Institute. You can even order it on Amazon. It's called Lucy, She's No Lady. This is by Dr. Menton, a brilliant scientist, uh, anatomist, and physician. And it shows on there, because he shows the actual Nova, where the guy is sitting in a lab with a power tool, and he's cutting that pelvis bone up into pieces, grinding off pieces, and then he glues it back into the shape of a human pelvis. That's what you see. He says, I was so lucky to catch how this fossilized incorrectly and was able to put it back into its original shape. This is what's taught in schools, folks, but not that part of the story. They teach that this is human. No, it's not. And there's other features on this skeleton that don't fit. They just don't show that this is human. It's an extinct tree climbing ape. This is not how we were created. When God created us, he created us totally out of something different. Not of a from one animal. It doesn't say that he transformed this animal to another type of animal to another type of animal. He created different kinds of animals. And then he created man out of the dust and the clay of the earth. That's what it talks about. I think i got to find my mouse here. There we go. So we were created in the image of God. Y'all caught this now. That Lucy is not our ancestor. Lucy is an extinct tree-climbing ape. We are created in the image of God. Now, let's move to the next part, now that you know that. So you are created to be in God's image. God is conforming us and changing us into a work of art, a masterpiece, uh, to make us more like his son. But people will then ask, well, if there is a God and if that story is true, then how come there's so much pain and anguish and suffering in the world? Well, part of it... God is removing from us, but we do. I mean, it's true. We live in a world that's really gone screwy. I mean, this is a messed up place. This is not what God created. Do you remember how God created? He made a beautiful garden. It was perfect. There was no pain, like I said last night. No pain, no disease, no suffering, no anguish, no death. But then we come along, and we rebel against God, and we brought everything down. As it says in the book of Romans, Paul writing under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the whole of the cosmos, the whole universe basically, is suffering for our decision. Now, God, because he is so powerful and he is so brilliant, way beyond what we can comprehend, he can actually use all these bad things that we do the death, the anguish, and suffering, it's not part of God's design, but God can use these circumstances as tools, as chisels and stuff, to make, in some cases, make us more like his son. He can use things like this. It's, it's, really under, it's really hard for us to understand why illnesses come. As I told you last night, one of the illnesses I had, they removed part of my colon. It was one of the most awesome times I had because I got so close to God. God can use these things, but the world is getting worse, and God said it would. 
He tells us often in the New Testament, things are going to get worse. People are going to start turning away from God. Well, that's happening. People are going to start believing the most bizarre, ridiculous things. Well, that's happening. We're seeing all these things happening like this. And God said, this is what's going to happen as we come into the last days. You know, one of the other things that he said, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, when the disciple says, when, what are the signs of your coming again? One of the things that Jesus said is there's going to be an increase in earthquakes. Do you know what happened this past week in Haiti? Major earthquake. 7.2 on a Richter scale. And then there was aftershocks. If we actually have a video on this on our website. Um, it's on geology uh, and the Bible. And in this, I actually went back and counted using government information from different governments how many earthquakes have happened over the years um, and centuries and stuff. And we are now, um, there's been over, so far since the year 2000, there have been over a thousand earthquakes of 5.0 or greater. It's, if you draw it out from a map from about the time of Christ, it sort of plateaus and is low, then all of a sudden you get to the 20th century and it just goes like this. And in the 21st century that we're living in now, more earthquakes are occurring. You're gonna keep hearing more and more. It also says there's gonna be more famines. Well, that's happening too. All these things are happening because we're coming into the last days of the last days, I believe. And God uses things. I mean, he told us this was gonna happen. And he's gonna come back and he's gonna fix this once and for all. And he's gonna be coming back as a judge. But he does have the ability to take bad things that happen to us and turn it into something good. He makes this promise to us in Romans chapter 8. Look what it says. Likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness. Our weakness being, we're not very healthy, we're not very good at doing stuff, where we mess up a lot. But the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Stop there for a second. <laughs> do, you, do you know what that says? We don't know what to pray for like we should. In other words, God's saying in prayer, we're ignorant. We're not too smart. We often pray for the wrong things. And we do. I have sat as a youth director over years, and I've heard some, as we've sat in a circle with teens and having them pray, they have prayed some of those bizarre prayers. Oh God, I need a new car. Please give me a new car. And, you know, and then he tries to justify it. If you give me a new car, God, I'll go around and get some friends from high school and bring them to church. That way it's going to be used for your honor and glory. Something doesn't sound right with that. Or remember one time a guy is praying, oh God, I want this girl to love me. I want her to just love me. I want this to be my wife and stuff like this. And he would pray so hard. And I was like, you know, you might not really want God to fulfill that prayer. And what ended up happening, she did then all of a sudden become attracted to him. And then a few weeks later, he was like, oh God, get this woman out of my life. Get her out of Oh, so what was I thinking? Yeah, we pray ignorant things sometimes. We don't understand the whole picture. So sometimes we pray not too smart. And that's what that says. We don't know what to pray for. But there's a cool thing about this. The Spirit, God himself, intercedes for us. He takes our prayers, as messed up as they are, because we don't know really what we should be praying for, and he intercedes with us, and he fixes our prayers, intercedes with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows it, what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes. When you pray, even though you pray something incorrectly, the Holy Spirit takes that prayer and fixes it to the Father, is what this is talking about. And so even, the, the point is, pray. Don't say, oh, I don't want to pray, I pray the wrong thing. Don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit's going to fix your prayer. What you need to do is talk to God. How many of you, I should see a lot of hands with this one, how many of you slept last night? <laughs> There's actually hands not up. That means one of three things. Either they're dead. <laughs> yeah, I hope not. Um, either they were up all night, or I've already killed them and put them to sleep. <laughs> so it's one or the other. I think probably everybody fell asleep last night. Do you know what you did when you were sleeping? You're just laying there, right? Maybe having some nice dreams. I think I dreamed about pirates last night. <laughs> Had nothing to do with camp. <laughs> no, there's no pirates sailing down the river. <laughs> But when you're laying there asleep, do you know what's going on? 
The Spirit of God. God is there in the room watching you, waiting for you to wake up in the morning so that you can talk to him. He is there waiting. How many of you here have a best friend? Oh, again, we got hands not going up. I feel so sorry for so. It's the adults we're having problems with. <laughs> Gee, you got a best friend. Is your best friend, who has a best friend who's not here? Your best friend is not here. All right? Do you wish your best friend was here? You guess. You need another best friend. <laughs> okay, let's put on a different frame. Okay, a little bit older group here. Who here is dating some girl? <laughs> I heard the story last night, so I knew I was going to get one hand up anyway. <laughs> Do you wish she was here right now? That's, see, that's what best friends do. When your best friend's not with you, don't you want to be close to them? Adults, how many of you, your spouse has to travel at certain times, maybe of the week or certain times of the year or something like that, you have to travel? Yeah? Don't you wish they were there? <laughs> I'm glad you're sitting in the back because you're sitting here going, nope. <laughs> I have to travel. I go around speaking. And when I go places, um, she, my wife often doesn't come. She hates to travel. I love to travel. She hates to travel. Um, but I sometimes absolutely just wish she was with me. And sometimes she works part-time at Dairy Queen. And she's the only person I know who brings treats to Dairy Queen. <laughs> I will come home. She will have a whole pile of chocolate chip, chip cookies or brownies or cheesecake and stuff like this that she makes. And I'm like, all right. She says, don't touch those. Those are for my workers at Dairy Queen. Don't you go to Dairy Queen? I keep trying to explain this to her. People go to Dairy Queen to get treats. But she justifies this by saying, I want to do something nice for my people. That's a biblical thing. That's what we're supposed to do, good works. She's doing good works. So she does that. But there are times when I'm gone that I just really miss her. And so when she's at Dairy Queen, even though I know she's not home, um, her voice was on the answering machine for so long when we had a landline. I would call up my phone, even though I knew she wasn't there, just to hear her voice. I'm sort of weird like that. I really miss hearing her voice. I wanted her with me. That's what this is talking about. That God is there with you, and he is with you all the time. As you are sleeping at night, he is right there waiting for you to walk up. Because what do you do? You talk to your best friends, and he's waiting for you to wake up and say, Good morning, God. This morning, not being too personal, I don't think, but my wife, is, when we woke up this morning, she turns, gives me a kiss, and she says, Good morning. Great way to start my day. And I thought when she did that this morning... This is exactly what God's doing. He's right there waiting for us to wake up. And then, good morning. How are you? Talk to me. Let's spend some time together. That's why we do like family devotions, I believe, here in the morning. Because God longs to hear you. He longs to have us pray and stuff. So that's what this is talking about. So, uh, and now look at the last part. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for those who are called according to his purpose. In other words, any bad thing that happens to us, this verse is saying here, God can take the worst circumstances and turn it into a special blessing. He can use it, in some cases as a chisel or whatever, he can use it for a special blessing. We don't often don't understand it. We don't like sometimes going through it this way, but that's how God does it because he's forming us into the image of his son. And making us a masterpiece. He does that. So, wrapping this up, what's the answer to the meaning of life? Well, God told us in his 66 love letters what our purpose of life is, and that's in Ephesians 2.10. It says that at the end of that verse, he created us, we talked about that now, uh, saves us, changes us, the, the metamorphosis we talked about, we'll talk more about that tonight, we're a work in progress to do good things he planned for us. We're supposed to do good things. Let's examine just for a second. It says at the beginning of that verse 10, 4, 
that's a um, primary preposition if you're into grammar, but that is the word epi in Greek, which means for distribution. Now, remember, verse 8 and 9, we're told how we are saved. Verse 10 tells us why we are saved, to distribute something. We're supposed to be distributing something. What? We distribute good works, good things. Good is the Greek word agathos, which is to give benefits, something that benefits someone. Do something today to benefit somebody. Open a door. Carry something. Help them walk around. Someone's lost. You think they're a little confused. Might be me today because I've never been here before. Tell me where something is or if something if I look really lost to you. Do some type of benefit. When you leave this camp, do this every day. Try and find something good to do for somebody. Also, the word was work. What are we doing? Good what? Good works. That's the word aragon, which means acts or deeds. Doing good deeds. A type of labor or job. You do it as good for, for people like that. Do you understand that we're not saved? Verse 10 does not tell... Well, let's go back. Verse 8 and 9 tells us how we're saved. Verse 10 does not say, for you are saved to give you fire insurance from hell. That's not why we're saved. That's not what that says. Though some people think that's all salvation is. If I confess Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, and I become a Christian, I don't have to go to hell. Boy, lucky out of that one. That's not the purpose God says. I mean, that's true. We don't go to hell, but that's not the purpose of our salvation. No, God tells us that since we're saved by grace through faith, we are to be like him, becoming masterpieces. And if you are like somebody, we become like an official ambassador. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says we are Christ's ambassador. An ambassador is an official title. You represent that person. When the United States government sends some person over to, say, the Bahamas to be a, an ambassador, they represent and act for the United States in the Bahamas. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And so you are supposed to act like Jesus in all circumstances. When Jesus walked on the earth, he had a purpose. This gives us a clue too. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. See what Jesus was doing? And we're supposed to be doing the same thing. We go around doing good things. Good things for people who are having hard times. We're not saved by doing good deeds. Very important. I want to make sure you understand this. That's not how we are saved. We're told the verse before how we are saved. We're saved by grace through faith. But too many times people think that if I do enough good deeds, God will love me more and I'll get to heaven. I had a conversation with a high school student just recently and I asked the question. I said, so why do you think you're going to go to heaven? And he says, well, I think I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a nice person. I said, what do you mean, nice person? He says, well, it's sort of like if you have a balance. And if I do enough good deeds as opposed to, not, you know, to the bad deeds, if I have more good deeds, I go to heaven. I go, you're not going to find that in Scripture. And I said, let's talk about this. Are you a good person? He says, yeah, I think I'm a good person. I said, all right. Have you ever lied to anyone? Well, well yeah. Did you ever steal anything that didn't belong to you? Well, yeah. Did you ever swear in God's name? Yeah, I do that quite a bit. Um, do you ever, you know, get jealous over something? And I just kept going through certain commandments. And he was like, every time, yep, yep, yep. And I said, well, how in the world do you call yourself a good person? I said, I'm just like you, along that line. The difference between you and me, God's forgiven me, God hasn't forgiven you because you haven't asked for it. We're not saved by doing good deeds. No. That's not what that verse says. We're saved by grace, through faith. That's how you get salvation. But when we are saved by grace through faith, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, as I talked about last night, and we start doing good deeds. As I said before, a person asked me, um, a high school student um, asked me when I was working up at a camp up north, asked me, I'm really not sure I'm a Christian. I said, why do you say that? I'm, I'm just not sure I'm a Christian. I said, okay. Do you know when you think you became a Christian? Yes. I said, do you remember what your life was like before that? 
What's your life, what you live like, how you act and stuff? Yeah. How do you act today compared to that? Is it the same or is it different? Oh no, it's totally different. Totally different. I said, chances are you're probably saved because you can't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and you keep living in an unsafe style. So, yeah, with more counseling, that person got helped out on that. But by becoming a Christian, we are then living lives, we are to worship God. That's a key thing. Why do I exist? We exist to worship God. And we do this by studying and listening to his 66 love letters. And then we can also help others to know about Jesus and to know about God. That's what we're supposed to do. Because it says in 1 John 1, 3, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you may have fellowship with us. Indeed, fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship, that's a relationship. You have relationships, you have best friends. God wants you to have a relationship with him. He wants to be your best friend. He wants to be in a close relationship that you guys talk. What do best friends do? They talk to each other, do they not? Sometimes they pass letters and notes to each other, sometimes even in class. They do things like this because they're best friends. God wants you to be his close friend. He's waiting for you to just accept his invitation there. And so that's what we're supposed to do is enter in a close fellowship. So why do I exist? One, to have fellowship with God and to have fellowship with other Christians. Other Christians going to church, stuff like this really helps a lot because it helps us in these difficult times to be around people who can help us and encourage us and stuff and recharge our batteries and help us in things. So that's part of our thing, to have fellowship with God and other Christians. Then we come across this. You must worship no other gods for the Lord, whose very name is Jealous, is a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. God is so jealous, he wants to have a personal relationship with you, which we're supposed to worship him. That's what we do. So why do I exist? Very simply, to have fellowship with God, to worship God. And by doing these things, we see that we start producing good deeds for people. That's what we do. Now tonight, we're going to talk more about this whole transformation thing. And we're going to get into some really cool things on metamorphosis and the changes that take place. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that content, you can find more like it on our channel and on our website. You can also book us and get the live experience, which in my opinion is even better. But who knows, I'm a little biased. You can also help us keep this content free by liking, sharing, and subscribing to our channel or our other social links. You can also help support this ministry by donating online through our website or in the link down in the description. And on that note, may the Lord be with you and we'll see you on the next video.